Okay, this is lecture 15, and in this lecture we'll be going through uh, a couple other signaling pathways, and in particular those involving ion channels and receptor tyrosine kinases. And the chapters this information's uh, brought up in is 12.6 uh, is the ion channels that we'll be talking about. 12.3 uh, are the uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at the insulin receptor as our specific example of that. Uh, and then we'll be talking a little bit about cell division in this lecture. Uh, and, and the regulation of cell division by protein kinases, specifically uh, CDKs. Uh, and I should mention that the specific examples we'll talk of, about of, of ion channels are the sodium ion channel and the acetylcholine ion channel, and both of those are gated. Okay, as you might remember, we've talked about I an ion channel before and when we talked about um, transport through membranes, and that was the potassium ion channel. And, and this channel here shown, um, remember we had these helices that had a dipole in them that kind of led uh, the ions in the right direction. Um, and you also had uh, this selectivity pore where only potassium ions can kind of fit in there and get uh, the hydrogen bonding interactions with that. Okay, this is um, an example of a, a channel that's sort of always open. But today we're going to be talking about those that are gated. Okay, and the, the gates on them can respond to a number of different things. Uh, in particular, changes in, in membrane potential. We call those volted, voltage gated. And then they also can respond to specific ligands at, on the receptor sites of these, and those would be considered ligand-gated ion channels. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned before, you know, there's, there's many uh, important examples of these, ex especially in the nervous system. And the two examples we're going to see today are voltage-gated voltage sodium channels and the ligand-gated uh, uh, nicotinic acetyl acetylcholine receptor. Okay. Membranes are, or they tend to be electric, electrically polarized, and, and what that means is that you'll have, um, for instance, more positive ions on one side, more negative ions on the other, uh, and then you'll get a a voltage difference between the inside and the outside. And typically, membranes are going to be negatively charged inside the cell compared to outside the cell. And the membrane potential is something like uh, negative 50 to negative 70 millivolts. Okay. This potential is largely due to what's known as a uh, sodium-potassium ATPase. And what this does is it pushes three sodium ions outside the cell and allows two potassium ions inside. So you're getting three charges outside, three positive charges outside the cell, two positive charges inside. What that's going to do over time is it's going to make the inside of the, the cell, the, that side of the membrane, more negatively charged. And that's where this, the negative membrane potential comes from. Okay. This flow of ionic species across membranes depends on concentration gradients and the overall electrical potential. All right, so here's an example of our uh, electrogenic pota sodium-potassium ATPase. So you have a channel part that's uh, in the membrane, and then you have a couple other pieces that, that take ATP and convert it to ADP so that it's using energy. This is an active, an example of active transport. Okay, and while it's doing that, it can move three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. Okay. And, and again, this generates that, that membrane potential. Okay. And in using that potential, um, chloride ions can move um, 
uh, down their their concentration gradient. Um, that's a bad example because it's actually moving. These chloride ions are actually moving against their concentration gradient, but because the membrane is polarized, it's more negative inside than outside. They can move uh, from outside excuse me, inside to outside against a concentration gradient because they're, they're moving down the electrical potential. Okay. Uh, calcium, this is going um, high concentration to low concentration. Okay, that's moving down a concentration gradient. Uh, potassium's higher on the inside than the outside, so that can move because it's being you know, pumped in by this system. It's going to be higher concentration inside the cell. So it can have, there's other channels like the potassium channel that we talked about uh, when we talked about membranes in transport. Potassium can move down a concentration gradient to the outside. And, and finally, sodium can move uh, down a concentration gradient from, uh, higher on the outside because it's, it's being pumped out by this. Uh, and then there's a, another channel for it to to move from its higher concentration to its lower concentration. Okay, how do you calculate a membrane potential? Well, that's that's detailed here. Um, I believe you have to do this on a homework problem, um, or at least I used to assign a homework problem like this. Um, not a not not going to be a huge part of the class, but you know if it if it shows up on the homework, it might might show up on the exam. And really, what you're doing here is you're using uh, a a modified version of um, a free energy equation. Okay, uh, um, the free energy is going to depend one on the concentration differences between the inside and the outside of the cell. But then also on this factor, and this um, Z is the charge, F is Faraday's constant, and then you have a membrane potential. So this is sort of the el electrical component, and this is the concentration component. Okay, at equilibrium, delta G equals zero, so we can set delta G equal to zero. And then we can solve for the membrane potential here, uh, and, and then the equation um, can be rewritten in this way. Okay, and you know Z is the charge of the ion you're looking at. Uh, uh, this funny script F is a constant, um, R is a constant, T is the temperature, and then you just need to know the concentrations inside and outside the cell, and you can calculate a membrane potential. Or if you're given a membrane potential, you could figure out you know one of the concentrations. So voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels, these are pretty p important in, in nerve signaling. Uh, so signals in nerves propagate as electrical impulses. So you can kind of think of nerve networks of nerve cells as sort of like wires in a way because they're propagating an electrical um, signal through them. Okay. And this, this electrical signal that goes through these nerve cells involves opening of voltage-gated channels, and, and particularly the, the sodium channel. Okay. That's, that's kind of what we're going to say is the first, first step here. There actually is another step first where a, a signal has to, ha to originally come into the nerve cell and then that will get the, the sodium channels to open. Uh, the sodium channels then propagate a, a depolarization of the membrane uh, until they reach the end of the nerve cell where voltage-gated calcium channels can open. Uh, that allows calcium inside the cell. That calcium then triggers the release of a neurotransmitter in this case, it's acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then opens a ligand-gated ion channel on the next receiving cell. Okay, so you have in this this whole system, you have examples of two voltage-gated channels: the sodium 
and the calcium. And then you also have a ligand gated channel, which is the acetylcholine uh, receptor. Okay, let's look at a picture of this. Okay, and this starts here at this is our step one, where we have some sort of a, a um, polarization wave that hits, that moves down this nerve cell. A, and that started from some stimulus that the this nerve cell picked up. So if you want to think of, you know, we, we, we talked about how sight that was a, a, um, with cis retinal going to trans retinal, and then that, that creates a, a signal. So you can think of that, you know, maybe as that was the stimulus. And then how that is propagated is you have this depolarization wave down the membrane that will eventually hit a voltage gated sodium channel okay that that channel will then open sodium can come into the the um the nerve cell and you get depolarization so there is a polarization wave you can open then this voltage gated sodium channel opens and you get depolarization Okay, so that goes down, you know, the nerve cell in, in a wave. Okay. Um, closely followed behind it, you get another voltage-gated ion channel that we don't really mention specifically, uh, except here. And that's the potassium, voltage-gated potassium channel. And this acts, it, it follows behind and it will actually open and allow potassium outside the cell, and that repolarizes the membrane. Okay. Right, so you have these two waves moving, you know, very closely um, behind one another. Once this uh, depolarization wave um, that you're getting from the opening of these sodium channels, once that comes to the end of this nerve cell, it will hit uh, the wave hits and it activates these cal voltage gated calcium channels. Okay, so once those open, calcium can come in. Okay. When calcium comes in the nerve cell, what that does is it triggers the release of these uh, secretory vesicles. Okay, and they contain acetylcholine. They also contain some of the sodium and calcium that has been let in these channels. And those are released into the, the synaptic cleft, okay? And they can, can travel to the next nerve cell. So that's what this is, the, the, the start of the next nerve cell. Acetylcholine will then bind to the acetylcholine receptor, okay? So that would be step five here. It would be binding. And then acetylcholine receptor can then open and, and that allows your, your sodium and calcium ions to go in, and that is what starts the, the next action potential, the, the next polarization wave. Okay. If we look a little bit closer, this is our uh, voltage-gated uh, sodium channel, okay. and this is a very big protein. It has four domains. They're very similar to one another. Okay, each domain has a total of six transmembrane helices. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, the important parts here are colored a little bit differently. There's a uh, blue helix, transmembrane helix in each domain. That one is what's known as the voltage sensor. Okay, between, and that's helix number four. Okay, between helix five and helix six, there's this red loop. And that structure uh, faces the outside of the cell. That red loop, these come together and form the selectivity filter. Okay, that allows only certain ions through. Okay, and that it makes up uh, the pore region uh, that the ions are gonna move through of this channel. Okay, and then finally, helix six, shown here in orange, that's what's known as the activation gate. Okay, that blocks the channel until 
a certain voltage is reached and then it can open. Okay, it, it works very closely with the voltage sensor helix. And we'll see a picture of this uh, that will make it uh, hopefully make more sense. Okay, and then finally, this green piece here that's located between on the inside of the cell between domain three and domain four, this is the inactivation gate that actually blo uh, blocks the, um, the channel as well when it's uh, supposed to be inactive. Okay, so this is how these, in the membrane, these four domains will kind of come together and make a, a sort of circular shape and on the inside of that, the area between these domains is where the pore is, where the ions will move through. Okay. And again, the red, the red portion, and we're not, we're not seeing these, these pieces in domain one. We're kind of um, omitting them just so we can see inside. But these red selectivity pore, selectivity filter um, folds will kind of come together in the center there. And that, that is what filters out the different ions, only allows sodium to, to pass through. Okay, the voltage helices are, are actually can move up and down depending on the membrane potential. And by doing that, they allow the heli uh, helix six, helices um, number six, to uh, open and close and, and be the gate, okay? And, and specifically activation gate. The inactivation gate um, has sort of a random structure and it, it'll be open and then in a certain amount of time, it kind of closes again. Uh, and it, it, you can think of it as sort of like a timer that the, this channel is allowed to, to stay open. Okay. So if we look at uh, the, this ligand gated channel, when it's in the off position, Okay, or closed uh, when the membrane's polarized. Okay, what we have when the membrane's polarized, it's more positively, or excuse me, more negatively charged inside and more positively charged outside. Okay, that voltage sensor helix, they will be pulled more towards the inside of the cell because they, they have some positive charges in that those helices. So they're gonna be pulled closer to the inside of the cell. Okay, when they do that, the activation gate helices, helice six, they, they are kind of smashed together and they close the pore. Right. When the membrane's depolarized, okay, and if it's depolarized, um, you know, the charges are, are sort of equal uh, equaled inside and out, uh, or at least they're not as negatively charged inside. What happens is the positive charged uh, voltage sensors will now move up. Okay, when they move up, it allows some room for the activation gate to kind of open up, right? Because we we see. It's drawn here in a cartoony kind of way, but you have this structure here that's a little bit more bulbous on the inside. Okay, and that's blocked by the voltage sensor when they're all the way down. But when those voltage sensors move up, that bulbous part can, can spread out a little bit more. And what that does is it opens that channel. Okay, when that channel is open, sodium can then pass from the outside of the cell to the inside. Right. This is what this looks like in real life. We, it's probably easier, right, to show these cartoon depictions, but this is just an example of what this looks like uh, on the, um, like a crystal structure of it. Okay, and you have this region here would be the selectivity filter, and if you look, it, it does make a very narrow hole there that only you know small ions can go through, and in this case, it's very specific to sodium. Okay, so that's the, the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay, 
An example of a ligand-gated channel would be the acetylcholine receptor. And specifically, it's called the, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And this is a, an ion channel, much like the sodium ion channel. It lets ions go through, but this one, it turns out, isn't as specific. It can uh, allows really all ions, but in specific... Um, specifically important are sodium and calcium ions to go through. Okay. This is li a ligand gated, gated, as I said, and that's opened by the ligand acetylcholine. This has a little bit different structure. Okay. As we saw in the, the sodium channel, right? we have four domains. And by the way, going back even further, all four of these domains are connected. So this is uh, one polypeptide. You have the N terminal here, C terminal over here. Okay. But in the acetylcholine receptor, it's, it's a little bit similar. You have these, these transmembrane helice regions but that make up domains. But in this case, we have five domains, not four. Okay? And we also, each domain is its own polypeptide, the, C, the N terminal um, going through to the C terminal. Okay? Each domain has four transmembrane helices. Okay? They're denoted M1, M2, M3, and M4. M2 is the one highlighted blue or purple here. Those are... Um, sort of important ones to, to remember. And uh, you have these outside regions uh, that allow the acetylcholine binding sites to them. Okay. And a, a typical way to de depict this in a cartoon version um, would be using these spheres. Okay, again, you have five of these um, separate polypeptide chains that are, you can really think of them as being identical, come together to form this, this complex, okay, five domain complex. And when it's closed, they have, uh, and, and this purple uh, is the, the M2 helix. Okay, so we're only showing the M2 helix here. The M2 helix kind of faces the inside of that pore. Okay, so this guy. Right, that M2 helix, they'll when it's closed, the residue, the residues that point on the inside are, are sort of bulky hydrophobic residues. And that that is what closes this pore or channel. Okay. The active binding acetylcholine and, and specifically two acetylcholine molecules need to bind this ligand-gated receptor. When that happens, you get a rotation in these, these helices, these M2 helices, and the hydrophobic residues that were, that were in the middle of the channel are now um, sort of buried, and you have a very small hydrophilic or polar residues that face the inside of the channel. So the channel is now open, to, for ions to move, and they can interact with the polar residues that face in that channel. This is acetylcholine. Uh, choline should be somewhat familiar because we, we, that was one of the head groups we talked about on, on phospholipids. And remember, choline was you know, two carbons with this uh, nitrogen uh, trimethylated uh, amine group here. Uh, with a positive charge. Okay, acetylcholine just has a, an acetyl group attached to it. Okay, so the, that was our discussion on these gated ion channels. Okay, the next type of, of signaling system that we'll talk about are the, the um, tyrosine kinases. Um, and these are what, what's known as enzyme-linked. Okay. Um, they're actually fairly complex structures. 
they have a extracellular domain that binds a ligand and an intracellular domain that has some sort of a catalytic activity. And the specific case that we're going to talk about, the, the tyrosine kinases, uh, that's their activity. They uh, And remember, kinase means an enzyme that phosphorylates something else. So what these do is they they phosphorylate other proteins on tyrosine residues. And and that tyrosine being phosphorylated is is a little bit um, unique as we've we've shown some other uh, kinases that that tend to phosphorylate on serine residues or threonine. Um, these receptors are are uh, targeted toward tyrosine residues. Okay. Okay. The first step in this is that um, these add a phosphate group to itself. Okay. That's called autophosphorylate phosphorylation. It's it's phosphorylating itself, which leads to a conformational change, which allows binding of uh, target proteins to the the catalytic site. Okay. And then the once that happens, it adds a phosphate group to a tyrosine in a specific target protein. There's quite a few of these. Um, they all have, you know, slightly different structures. The one that we'll see an example of, um, the primary example that we'll use for this class is the insulin receptor. And, and that's this guy shown here, the INSR. Um, stands for uh, insulin uh, receptor. Okay. It has a, a sort of complex extracellular domain with alpha and beta um, parts to it. Okay, It doesn't necessarily matter that you know this structure. You just understand that um, this structure this structure is responsible for binding insulin. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out that it's actually a dimer. You have, you know, if um, this would be the alpha subunit and this is the beta subunit, you have two of those stuck together. So two alphas and two betas. Okay. On the inside of the cell, this blue region is the, the part that has the tyrosine kinase activity. Okay, so that is sort of um, repeated in these other um, tyrosine kinase receptors. Um, there's um, F GFR is the fibro fibroblast growth factor receptor. Uh, a lot of these are um, the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR. A lot of those, uh, that's what these are, are uh, growth factor receptors. And they're, the difference between these and the insulin, these are in mono, a monomeric form. Um, the insulin receptor is always in this dimer. But these exist in their inactive forms uh, in monomers. When they bind their, their ligand, that's when they can actually go and, and dimerize with a, another copy of itself and then autophosphorylate. So in, in, it's easier to see this on the, the insulin receptor when it binds insulin, you know, that might activate this region. This will then phosphorylate this side. This side will phosphorylate that side. And then they both can phosphorylate other target proteins. And, and we'll see that again here when we look specifically at the insulin receptor pathway. Okay. Insulin is a, a hormone, and what it does is it, it, it tells a cell to, to uh, uptake glucose and, and you know start the metabolism of glucose. Okay. This uh, hormone, insulin, is, it's a peptide. It's actually made out of amino acids a short chain of amino acids. It's produced uh, in the pancreas. Okay. It's produced and released uh, in response to nutrients, in particular glucose. So your blood sugar level, uh, you eat something, those sugars in it you know, get absorbed into your bloodstream, your blood sugar goes up, 
that triggers your pancreas to release insulin. Okay. Insulin then travels through your system. It reaches target cells, uh, in particular, things like the liver muscle. Um, uh, binding of that insulin to the insulin receptor initiates a cascade of events that eventually leads to increased glucose uptake and storage. Okay, so in, in normal people, when you eat something, your blood sugar will go up, you know, fairly rapidly. Uh, and then also fairly rapidly, you'll release insulin and that re- insulin will tell your cells to take up some of this glucose and, and then your blood sugar kind of drops back down to a normal level. Um, it's important because glucose actually is um, somewhat toxic in, in higher levels and it, it can cause uh, a lot of bad things. And that's why people with diabetes um, either diabetes uh, type one where it's you know hard to make they they can't make enough insulin or type two where they're they're desensitized to insulin um what that does is it it creates um higher blood sugar levels and over time that can can lead to some bad bad things happening okay so one thing that this this receptor controls is the import of glucose into the cell. So insulin will bind your insulin receptor. Um, I guess I should start at one. So uh, in in this state, uh, I guess you could call this a, a fasted state, um, the glucose transporters, these molecules that allow transport of glucose into the cell, they are stored in uh, vesicles okay so they're not they're not in the outside membrane the plasma membrane they're stored in vesicles okay insulin will bind the insulin receptor you get the the auto phosphorylation of uh, each of these subunits okay then they become active they can phosphorylate other enzymes that leads to a cascade which eventually um, turns on the incorporation of these vesicles into the plasma membrane that contain the glucose transporter. Those transporters, when they're in the membrane, can then allow the uh, glucose to travel inside the cell. Okay. Um, eventually, the insulin levels um, will drop. The glucose transporters are going to be removed from the plasma membrane by or endocytosis so these you know portions of membrane can can kind of pinch off and be turned back into vesicles for and the um, transporters can then be stored uh, for when they need to to be used again so that's one way in which this this works it um, this pathway works to put a transporter in the membrane that allows glucose to be um, carried inside the cell okay and once it's inside the cell it's it's less toxic because it can be um, either used in the form of uh, metabolism glycolysis or it can be stored uh, in, in the form of glycogen okay another way in in which these pathways work are are by regulating uh, gene expression okay and and that's through a, a signaling cascade so it, uh, insulin this red dot here represents our insulin peptide it binds to the extracellular domains of the receptors and it activates the catalytic domain inside okay so this extracellular domain is actually you know pretty big in in this receptor and again it's a dimer so there's two specific sites for this to uh, for insulin to bind but here we show it only binding on on one of the sites first okay so once it binds that switches on uh, the catalytic activity uh, so the catalytic domain in one receptor uh, in, in this side right this side binds insulin this is turned on this guy then phosphorylates tyrosine residues in the adjacent uh, receptor 
Okay, so then it phosphorylates these guys. Okay, there's some structural changes um, shown here, and these are the tyrosines, um, the specific tyrosines that get phosphorylated. There are three of them. Um, not as important that you know their their numbers, but knowing that there are three of them would, would probably be more important. Okay, that when they're phosphorylated, that causes a structural change that uh, actually opens up uh, the the active site here. And when that that during that structural change, what happens is it it allows the target proteins to then bind with this and then this domain when it's active like that phosphorylated target proteins can bind and then it can phosphorylate the target proteins okay and the the uh, in particular the target protein in this pathway that we'll talk about is a protein called irs1 And uh, this insulin signaling cascade, right? Uh, the indirect uh, interaction of phosphorylated IRS1. So IRS1 gets phosphorylated by the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. IRS1 then interacts indirectly with uh, what's known as RAT ROS protein or RAS protein, RAS. RAS protein is an example of a G protein, okay? So this is, um, it's not a, a G protein coupled receptor, but it, it, this G protein is used in this pathway, okay? So IRS1, a phosphorylated IRS1 can then um, interact with RAT, ROS and actually um, cause a, a series of protein phosphorylations. Okay. ERK or ERK is one of the proteins that is phosphorylated um, in this cascade. ERK will then enter the nucleus and it can, can cause the um, transcription factor ELK1 to become phosphorylated. And when ELK1 is phosphorylated, it becomes active and it will stimulate the expression of, of specific genes needed in, in glucose metabolism or glucose transport. And, and one of those genes would be a uh, glut for one of the glucose transporters. Okay, so showing this in a picture form would probably be easier to understand. Okay, so here we have insulin binding the insulin receptor. Okay, that will phosphorylate the other side of this receptor and make it active. Okay, then you can have insulin um, binding the other side, which would phosphorylate this side. Okay, um, once these are active and phosphorylated, IRS1 can bind, and when it binds the the ki the tyrosine kinase region of the receptor, it gets phosphorylated on on specific uh, tyrosine residues. Okay. When IRS1 is phosphorylated, uh, it can then interact with these proteins, GRB2 and SOS. Okay, when that happens, um, when, it, when it forms this complex, it then can interact with ROS. ROS then becomes active and it can bind GTP. Uh, the activated ROS protein will then bind and activate uh, RAF1. RAF1 uh, phosphorylates a protein called MEK, uh, uh, MEK. MEK uh, is phosphorylated on serine residues. Okay, so the tyrosine uh, kinase is, is specifically in this receptor. Um, now we're getting into a kinase cascade where we're, we're looking more like a classical kinase. Um, so RAF is phosphorylating MEK on serine residues. Okay. MEK then can phosphorylate uh, ERK or ERK. And this uh, is 
on threonine and tyrosine residues, probably not super important that you remember exactly what residues are being phosphorylated on these guys. Um, ERK, when it's phosphorylated, then can uh, it becomes active. It goes into the me uh, nucleus, and it activates and phosphoryl by phosphorylating uh, ELK1. Okay. And ELK1 um, also needs uh, another transcription factor, SRF, but probably not as important that you remember that. Um, you can think of ELK1 as the, the transcription factor that it matters here. Uh, transcription factor, what that means is it binds to um, regions of DNA that tell the cell, okay, express this, this gene. When that transcription factor binds, then that, that gene that it's binding on, um, or the gene after where it binds, will then be translated, uh, excuse me, transcribed into uh, messenger RNA and then translated into protein. Okay, so that's this, uh, this sequence in a nutshell. And you can see that there's, um, just thinking back to our, when we talked about the five characteristics of signaling pathways, can we see some examples of those? And off the top of my head, um, this IRS1, when it, it forms this complex with GRB2 and SOS, that's sort of a, an example of modularity. Okay, it's, it's forming uh, a, a complex sort of interchangeable parts really um, at these, these phosphorylated regions. Okay. Um, it can also, um, for instance, in, in a different pathway, it can, you know, form a complex, you know, at another phosphorylated region. Okay. So this is an example of, of modularity. Okay. Um, and then the amplification, right? So if we have one ROS protein being activated here, we're likely to get several RAF uh, one proteins being activated. Uh, and then each RAF one protein that's activated can uh, activate several MEK proteins. And you, you would get amplification at each of these steps, which gives you the, the kinase cascade. There are other tyrosine kinases. There, there are quite a few of these. Um, the JAK-STAT signaling system, and these you will not need to know any specifics on. Uh, I'm just throwing them out there uh, in case you're interested. Uh, people going into medicine might be, um, you might deal with these more depending on what field you get into. Okay. Um, JAK is the protein kinase. Uh, stats are signal transducers uh, and activate activators of transcription. Okay, so you have, uh, and, and one of these um, is the erythropoietin or EPO receptor. Okay, that e EPO is a, a peptide hormone. It, it binds this uh, tyrosine kinase, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, and it activates uh, Jack and, and Jack then phosphorylates stat and, and these stats can then um, affect the expression of a gene. And so EPO uh, specifically increases your production of, of red blood cells. Okay. And it's been used as a performance enhancing drug, right? And the biggest example is in cycling. Um, people like Lance Armstrong use this. Uh, he used it um, one of the things he used to, to win seven Tour de France's in a row, um, but he's not the only one. This is Bjarne Ries, and he actually, um, a couple years before Lance won his first Tour, um, Bjarne Ries won a Tour de France, and the joke about him was he was called Mr. 60% because his hematocrit was 60% because he, he was taking so much EPO. There can be crosstalk between um, tyrosine kinase receptors and, and specifically in uh, G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the, the example we use the insulin receptor, 
Okay, that can can phosphorylate IRS1. Okay, this IRS1 can then phosphorylate um, a protein known as PKB, which then phosphorylates um, serine residues on, on the tail of the beta adrenergic receptor. When those are phosphorylated, it, it signals that this uh, receptor should be put into a, a storage, in a sense, in a vesicle and taken out of the membrane. Okay, and if you think about that, does that make sense? Well, um, these are kind of competing pathways, right? Uh, insulin um, being sent out tells you that you need to take up and store blood sugar. Uh, beta adrenergic receptor is more that you need to, when, the, when this is active and it's being signaled by a, a, a epinephrine, it, it's telling you that, okay, you need to liberate energy. You need to get glucose out of, of glycogen because you're going to need to use it. Um, so if you have enough blood sugar already, uh, you don't really need these beta adrenergic receptors to be releasing more glucose from glycogen. Okay, so they're, they're kind of um, going in different directions uh, of, in the, the metabolism and storage of glucose. Okay. Another example here is uh, the, the insulin receptor can also phosphorylate a tyrosine residue on the beta adrenergic receptor, uh, which then can couple uh, other proteins, in, in particular, importantly, GRB2 SOS, which then activates RAS, which then activates RAF1, MAC, and ERK again, and then you get uh, an alteration of gene expression. Okay, so it, it's not um, this, this activation of gene expressions isn't only from the activation of IRS1. You can also get that same um, endpoint by activating, in this case, our, our G protein coupled receptor. Okay, uh, the final thing we'll talk about in this lecture are um, some, some cell cycle regulation. Okay, and these are, are done by what's known as cyclin-dependent protein kinases, or, or CDKs cyclin-dependent kinase. Right, and just as a, a and refresh your memory, um, the cell cycle, okay, you have um, certain phases of, of the cell, right? Um, the, and these, you, you won't need to know these in, in the class, right? But the transition between these different cycles, it, you can look at the expression in the level of these specific um, cyclin-dependent kinases, right? They, uh, concentration of, of, in this case of this one goes up as you transition from G1 to S, okay? And then it goes away and you get another one that increases as you're transitioning from S to G2 and then again from G2 to M, okay? And so how do these work? Well, they're regulated by phosphorylation. Um, that's kind of been a, a theme of our most of these uh, signaling pathways, okay? And also by proteolysis. And that's the um, breakdown of, of the um, protein by um, breaking specific peptide bonds. Okay, so if we look here at the starting point, our cyclin-dependent kinase in this state is inactive, okay? There's, there's no cyclin bound to it. Uh, it's inactive. Okay, the second step uh, is where we have a production of a molecule known as cyclin, um, a, a, a small protein molecule. And synthesis of this um, leads to accumulation of it. It then can, can bind its cyclin-dependent kinase. Okay, this actually is 
um, still inactive because it's phosphorylated on a tyrosine residue and spe specifically tyrosine 15. Okay, that blocks uh, an ATP binding site. This is still inactive. Okay, um, it's phosphorylated again on a threonine at 160. Okay, um, that, that phosphorylation and the removal of the uh, phosphate group on tyrosine 15 will activate uh, the cyclin CDK uh, protein. Okay, so once that's active, one of the things that it, it's a kinase, so it, it phosphorylates other things. One of the things that phosphorylates is a, a phosphatase protein. And a phosphatase is a protein that cuts off phosphate groups. So when it activates that, that can then go and cut off more of that phosphate group on tyrosine 15. And you'll see that that's kind of a, a sort of a cycle, a vicious cycle here, where you activate one molecule of your cyclin CDK, and then it can activate a phosphatase. That phosphatase then, then can go and activate many more copies of your cyclin CDK. And so you get a big amplification there. Okay. Um, it can then go in when these active CD cyclin CDK complexes can then go phosphorylate other proteins that are involved in, in cell cycle regulation. Okay. Turning this off, that's shown here in the gray, how does that happen? Well, one of the things, um, once you get enough of these activated, they'll start phosphorylating um, this protein, uh, DBRP. Okay, and what DBRP does uh, when it's activated by adding a phosphate to it, it attaches molecule known as ubiquinin uh, to the cyclin uh, part of this complex. Okay, and that, that's shown here as U, ubiquinin. Uh, and it, it, it adds many of these to, to cyclin. And what that does, the, the ubiquinin targets that for breakdown. Okay, so things that have lots of that ubiquinin uh, chain attached to them targets that, and, and specifically in a pro, it's a protein that we're attaching ubiquinin to it targets it to be degraded by the proteasome in, inside the cell, okay? So you add these to it, the, that says, okay, bring this to the proteasome and it's gonna be digested, okay? And when it does that, it removes the cyclin from your CDK and then it, that turns it back off. Okay. So growth factors, and this is FYI, don't need to know the specifics here, but growth factors trigger transcriptional regulation of CDKs. And remember, growth factors, uh, those tyrosine um, receptor tyrosine kinases that we saw, many of the ligands for those are growth factors. So growth factors will, will bind to their, their receptor tyrosine kinases. You then get a kinase cascade. Um, the phosphorylation of, of proteins known as June and FOS will then activate your cyclins and your CDKs. Um, you can also, that, that goes to activate other transcription factors um, and enzymes for DNA synthesis. And all those combined effects will give you, uh, in this case, a, a passage from the G1 phase to the S phase. Okay, some other, some other uh, important um, cell cycle regulation activities. Okay, if, if you have a break in your double-stranded DNA, okay, that activates um, a, a protein known as P53. Okay, P53, when it's active, um, uh, it's a, a transcriptional regulation that it will lead to the the increased concentration of a protein known as P21. Okay, P21 
uh, acts as kind of a, a clamp or a cap on uh, your CDK uh, cyclin, and, and specifically this is CDK2 cyclin E, a complex, it, it, it caps that and it activates it. Uh, and then it, it, and what that does is it, it stops the cell from going into um, the next cell cycle and, and onto cell division. Okay, so it might seem a little counterintuitive, right? You're blocking a process of the cell, but it, that's important because if you have this big break in DNA and you go to try to, to, to replicate that cell, you're going to get an error that's because of that missing DNA passed on to the next generation of cell, which is, is not good. Okay. So this is really what P53 and P21 are doing is to say, Hey, we need, we need to stop this cell from, from, from dividing and, and being replicated because it's, it's DNA is, is compromised. Right. And, and that, um, that's important in people that have errors uh, or, de or deficient in P53 or, or even P21 uh, are more susceptible to cancers because of that, because they, they don't have this mechanism or this mechanism isn't working as well to stop a cell that has some, some damaged DNA from being replicated. Um, and that's uh, another way that the, the cell cycle and, and cell division can be kind of, um, messed up is, is by actually damaged tyrosine receptor kinases. And so this is our, uh, epidermal growth factor, uh, receptor. And so this is the binding domain. Okay. There's there, it exists as a monomer. Once it binds that growth factor, then it can dimerize. And when it dimerizes, then you get these um, one, one side phosphorylates the other and, and vice versa, activating those um, tyrosine kinase domains. If you have a case where you have um, uh, this protein that's missing that binding domain, you can have a case where this tyrosine kinase is, is always on. Okay, it's, it's never off. It's always on. It's constantly active in phosphorylating other proteins. Okay, and when that happens, um, you're, you, you have no control. So it, it's just phosphorylating everything. Everything's on. And that's uh, a situation where uh, you, again, have uncontrolled cell growth. And, and that kind of is a clue that you're, you know, either, either cancer or um, going in that direction. And that's why this uh, protein kinase inhibitors are are actually many cancer drugs are are targeting protein kinases and um, and receptor tyrosine kinases uh, to inhibit them for the treatment of cancer. Right, and this is if we look at CDK2, this is our cyclin dependent kinase. So this is not the the tyrosine kinase receptor, it's our CDK, um, the cyclin dependent kinase. Okay, this is what it looks like when ATP is bound, that binding site. And then this, this drug here, this anti-cancer drug, binds in that site as well, but it, it binds in a very um, much more tighter than the ATP itself. And in a sense, it, it doesn't get let out of that active site and it blocks it from ATP, which you need to, to become active. Okay, if ATP is not there, it, this, this kinase can't, doesn't have any fo a source of phosphate groups to, to phosphorylate the next protein in the, the series. Okay, so next time we'll finish up on chapter 12 and in particular, we're going to be talking about integrins and some nuclear hormone receptors. It maybe mention a little bit about uh, oncogenes. Um, we, we sort of did that a little bit here today, kind of brought that up. Um, next lecture will be one of the shorter lectures uh, in the semester, though. Um,
so it, it I guess in terms of the exam, it it won't have a, a huge effect on the exam as far as the amount of material, but I'm I'm sure there will be you know at least one question from the next lecture on the exam.